The scripture reading this morning is from Psalm chapter 34. Psalm 34. We'll be reading verses 1 through 22. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul will make its boast in the Lord. The humble will hear it and rejoice. O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he answered me, and delivered me from all my fears. They looked to him and were radiant, and their faces will never be ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and rescues them. O taste and see that the Lord is good. How blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. O fear the Lord, you his saints. For to those who fear him there is no want. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger. But they who seek the Lord shall not be in want of any good thing. Come, you children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Who is the man who desires life and loves length of days that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous, and his ears are open to their cry. The face of the Lord is against evildoers, to cut off the memory of them from the earth. The righteous cry, and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He keeps all his bones, not one of them is broken. Evil shall slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. The Lord redeems the soul of his servants, and none of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for the privilege we have to know you as our Father and praise you for your goodness, your loving kindness toward us each and every day. We thank you for the privilege we have of gathering together to worship you, to praise your name, for sending your Son to die in our place that we might have life. We thank you for him because he rose from the, from the grave the day that we commemorate this morning. We ask that your spirit might speak to us through your word, convict us of our sin, of our need for a savior, our need also to walk with you, to obey your word. We praise you for what you'll accomplish in and through us this day. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Greg. Good morning, everyone, and happy Easter. It is good to be here, even though we're not able to be here together it is still, nevertheless, a very special time of year for us as we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, and we are very grateful to the Lord that he has allowed us to live during this time and age in which we can still at least come together around his word and uh, do that even though we can't fellowship with one another. If you are tuning in today as a guest, we especially wanted to 
thank you for doing that as our guest today and welcome you and thank you for the time that you're taking to do that. And we want to encourage you in the word. And if there is any special way that we can minister to you, uh, please let us know. We'd be only happy to do that. It would be our joy. And if you have any questions, importantly, about the gospel, if you have any questions about the message of eternal life that you can have and that you'll hear about this morning, you can send us a message either on our church Facebook page or you can go to our church website, www.highpointbaptist.church. Church is the domain, www.highpointbaptist.church, and you can email me directly there or you can submit a prayer request to our elders or even use that tool to ask a question as well or maybe inquire further about our church, or about the gospel, the message of good news. Our message for this morning is coming from Psalm 34, as Greg has just read, right about in the middle of your Bibles, if you have them with you. If you have a Bible available, we encourage you to follow along with us in the Scriptures. The Psalms, of course, are in the Old Testament, and you might be wondering, oh, wait a minute, I came here for an Easter message. It's Resurrection Sunday. Shouldn't we be in the New Testament? (laughs) But if you bear with me, you'll see that this is really the perfect text, I think, for this Sunday. It addresses the insecurities of life and our response to it. And then if we were to go down to verse 22, we would see that the answer to all of life's trouble is answered in this one little statement At the end, the Lord redeems. That is the message of Easter. The Lord redeems. That is the work that Christ accomplished in his death, his burial, and his resurrection. But I want to begin in a similar way that we did last time, and that is to remind you of the obvious, and that is we are living in unprecedented times, aren't we? In fact, it's almost become a catchword in the last few weeks. But it isn't because of the coronavirus that our times are unprecedented. Disease has always ravaged humanity since man rebelled against God in the garden. And the penalty for that rebellion is death, as the wages of sin is death. Therefore, Romans 5.12 tells us, just as through one man sin entered into the world and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. And as we already said, Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. Death is an ever-present reality. And because all sinned, we all die. None of us can change that. Disease and death ravage our world. Just to put it in perspective, as we likely near the peak of the corona pandemic in the United States, hopefully in this next week, approximately 2,000 people died of the virus on Friday, this past Friday, Good Friday. Under normal conditions, about 8,000 people in America die each day on average. The HIV virus has killed about 1.6 million people worldwide. And according to the World Health Organization, the annual flu kills anywhere between 250 and 500,000 people every year. Malaria still kills approximately 600,000 people every year around the globe. The rotavirus annually kills an average of 440,000 children. 
The rabies virus, though less common in the United States, is so deadly that only three people in United States history are known to have ever survived the disease without the vaccination. Three people. In 1918, as the Spanish flu ravaged the world, which was the last time churches had to close in America, the best research estimates that upward towards 100 million people died over 24 months. According to the CDC, that number is approximately 50 million, but the Spanish flu ravaged the world during World War I, and it is widely recognized that... Nations suppressed the death counts so as to prevent enemies from knowing the actual effect of the flu on their resources. That disease was so harsh that many people died merely from the trauma that the virus brought on. Most of the people who died were actually those who were between 20 and 40 years of age with the strongest immune systems. Most of the people who died had the strongest immune systems, not the weakest, because the disease was so terrible that their own immune systems killed them in the attempt to kill the virus. In the immune system's effort to kill the virus, it killed the person, it killed the host. So, do we really think that we can escape death? Amos says in Amos 3, 6, If there is a calamity in a city, will not the Lord have done it? 1 Samuel 2, 6, The Lord kills and makes alive. He brings down to the grave and brings up. And later, 2 Samuel 10, 12 said, May the Lord do what is good in his sight. We cannot escape death. Hebrews 9, 27 says, It is appointed for men to die, and then comes the judgment. And that's why the 5th century theologian Augustine wrote in his book titled, Where the Life of Mortals Should Be Called Death Rather Than Life, from which we get our message these last two Sundays. For from the very beginning of our existence in this dying body, there is never a moment when death is not at work in us. For throughout the whole span of this life, if indeed it is to be called life, its mutability leads us towards death. Certainly, there is no one who is not closer to it this year than last year, and tomorrow than today, and today than yesterday, in a little while hence than now, and now than a little while ago. So is it because of another virus, another disease, another thing that threatens our life And that brings death that these days are unprecedented. I don't think so. Death is reality. What is unprecedented is our response to it. What is unprecedented is our fear. And the reason why we are so afraid is because for so long we have bought into the illusion that we are in control of when we die. David wrote in Psalm 139.16, though, In your book were all written the days that were ordained for me, when as yet there was not yet one of them. God determines when we die, and all men die. But for those who know God and stand in a right relationship with Him, 
The fact that God has ordained the number of our days is a source of comfort for those who do not, who will have to stand before Him on account of their own merit. That is a source of great fear. But this is what I want you to know. In Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 23 says, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked. God says, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Verse 32 For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone who dies, declares the Lord God. Therefore, repent and live. That is to say, if you turn away from your sin and unbelief to the one who redeems, you will live. And that is the message of Psalm 34. But Romans chapter 5, verse 8 to 11 says, But God demonstrates His own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than, having now been justified by His blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through Him. For if while we are enemies, we are reconciled to God through the death of His Son, much more... Having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only this, but we also exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we now have received the reconciliation. And then verse 17, For if by the transgression of the one, death reigned through the one, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in the life of the one through Jesus Christ. And verse 21, so that as sin reigned in death, even so grace would reign through righteousness to eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. As sin reigned in death, even so, grace would reign through righteousness to eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. So my greatest concern for you is not what you can do or what others can do to save this life. There is nothing any of us can do to ultimately save this life. My greatest concern for you isn't your standard of living, your wealth, your health, your prosperity, how well you can live this life, how long you can prolong this life. My greatest concern, and really my only concern at this point, is whether or not you will have eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. And that is the lesson that David is reminding us of and that he himself is reminded of. And he learns that lesson the hard way. You know this from last time that David's life is threatened and in the midst of uncertainty, he takes his life into his own hands. He seeks to preserve his life and the consequences of that are devastating. And the entire city of Nob is slaughtered as a result on David's account, and David saves his life, he rescues his life, he prolongs his life, but nothing about his circumstances that threatens his life has changed. He is still without food, he is still without water, 
and he is still being hunted down by Saul. In other words, nothing has changed about his circumstances, and David now writes to instruct us from the seat of pain. These are not the words of a king in an ivory tower for whom suffering, pain, anxiety, anguish, the insecurities of life are at best a distant recollection. Or otherwise a reality that he is completely unfamiliar with. David writes Psalm 34, he is a fugitive, and there's a price on his head, and now he knows the extent to which King Saul will hunt him down. There are great consequences. And David responds that in spite of his circumstances being even worse, he responds with, praise, the praise of verses 1 to 3, because David knows that even though he can't see all that God is doing in his adversity, he does know that God is good, and that becomes then his testimony in verses 4 through 7. David is desperate. So, what is a desperate man's testimony? Again, verses 4 through 7, I sought the Lord, and he answered me, and delivered me from all my fears. They looked to him and were radiant, and their faces will never be ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and rescues them. Does that surprise you? This, this confession of a man whose circumstances are so severe it threatens his own life and now he makes a testimony of deliverance, of salvation, a testimony of declarative praise for the work that God has done in delivering David from all his fears. In verse 6, he speaks of being saved out of his troubles. Verse 7, the angel of the Lord, speaking of Jesus Christ, that's who this individual was. Angel is a translation, or rather a transliteration of the Greek word angelos. It means messenger, the messenger of the Lord. And in this context, is referring to Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. Jesus Christ encamps around those who fear him and rescues them. Well, I thought you said that David's circumstances didn't change. But now David speaks of Jesus Christ rescuing him. He speaks of being saved out of his troubles. He speaks of being delivered from all his fears. I thought David is, is writing from the seed of pain because his circumstances didn't change. I thought his predicament is worse, if anything, and that's true. That's true. Look carefully. Look carefully at verse 4. What does David say he is delivered from? His situation? His trial? His circumstances? The thing that threatened his very life? What is he saved from? What is he delivered from? Well, his fears. Remember we said last week that Paul calls us to pray to the Lord with thanksgiving when we endure trials in Philippians 4, 6, and we said that prerequisite to thanksgiving is a heart of humility. Psalm 34, 2. And we see David's heart of humility now that is willing to submit to the adversity that God has permitted in his life. The humble will hear it and Rejoice. He is now humbled. 
And now he has a heart of thanksgiving and a heart of humility. And even as David's situation doesn't change, his heart did as he recognizes God's sovereignty in his suffering. And in that, the Lord delivers David not from the suffering, but from his fears. The troubles of Psalm 24 verse 6 are the troubles of his soul. The terror, the uncertainty... And God saves David from all of them as David now is reminded of the faithfulness and trustworthiness of God. And now David no longer needs to know what exactly God is doing. God saves David from all his troubles. That is the extent of God's salvation for this poor man's cry. So, what is the lesson here? God delivers those who are humble in heart, who earnestly seek Him for salvation. The angel of the Lord, in verse 7, did this thing that only God could do. Again, this is to speak of the second person of the Trinity. That word angelos, that word angel, meaning simply messenger. It is in reference to the one who could say only what God could say, the one who could act with authority that only God could have, the one who comes to rescue his people as he does here. And David acknowledges that he knows the angel of the Lord is with him. And and again, who does that sound like to you? The one who acts with authority, the one who rescues his people, the manifestation of the Lord on earth in the Old Testament. And how does he encamp around David to protect him? Joshua 5.14 identifies the angel of the Lord, the Son of God, as the captain of the Lord's army. In 2 Kings chapter 6, he is the leader of the angelic host, so God sends his son to preside over his angelic army to protect David. Can you imagine? And he does that for this one child. You might say, well, that might be true, but you don't know me. David, David was a special man. He was a royal man. He was a king. He was a great king. Didn't the Bible say somewhere that he was even a, a, a man after God's own heart? And he, was a, he was a godly man. He was exemplary. So I, I can see where certainly God would save his son, and send the angel of the Lord, an angelic host, to protect him. But David wasn't any of that in Psalm 34. David was a humbled sinner, saved by grace. And the lesson is that God delivers those who are humble in heart and who are devoted to Him and seek Him. What a testimony then to the goodness of God. And so then David calls on you and me to experience the goodness of God for ourselves, even in our adversities in verses 8 through 14. Then you have a desperate man's petition. And this is the turning point, really, in the psalm where David's psalm goes from a psalm of instruction to exhortation. It is, a, it is a psalm that fills both roles. It is both instructive and it is exhortatory. It is a song of praise and it is a song of instruction. And now we see David's instruction, how we should respond to the goodness of God, even though we don't understand necessarily what he is doing. In short, David instructs us that we shouldn't be concerned 
about this life, but eternal life. So, this is a poor man's, an afflicted man's wisdom. Taste and see that the Lord is good. When was the last you heard those words from an afflicted man's mouth? A poor man's mouth. I call on you to taste and see that the Lord is good. See who God is in his person and in his character, and his works. But he he doesn't want you to just see. He, He wants you also to taste it. That is to say, to experience it. He wants you to experience the goodness of God in your adversity, in your trial, and your circumstances for yourself. He doesn't want you to talk about it. He doesn't want you to affirm it in the lives of others in their trials and their difficulties. He doesn't want you to say, well, I'm I'm glad that works for so-and-so, or I'm glad that works out for you. This profession, this trust that you have in God, it just doesn't work for me. I'm going to find peace somewhere else. Interestingly, in Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek, the three languages the Bible was written in, the word for peace also carries the idea of completeness, safety, the idea that all is well. None of those are realities in a world without God that seeks to find peace apart from Him. No matter how much of a handle we think we have on a pandemic, no matter the cures that we have for disease, no longer how much we think we can prolong our days, no matter how much we have a grasp on the economy, no matter how secure our livelihoods, peace, completeness, safety, that all is well, are not realities apart from God. Peace cannot be offered by this world. The only peace that this world pretends to offer is a temporal, fleeting, false peace. There is no eternal safety in any stay-at-home order or any kind of social distancing, but the world will always try to manufacture its own peace. It'll always try to find inner peace by advancing the postmodern propaganda that you can find peace in whatever. Whatever religion... Whatever exercises, yoga, breathing techniques, self-acceptance, whatever kind of legislation, whatever kind of mandate, but there is no well-being apart from God. There is no comfort for those who are estranged from God. Any other illusion of peace is circumstantial and fleeting. Only when you have come to be declared righteous before a holy God can you have peace with God on the basis that your relationship with Him has changed and you have therefore come to know the goodness of God. And David challenges you to taste and see that the Lord is good. How confident. How confident. (laughs) And it is a confidence that transcends this 
physical life. There is a sequence here between these two verbs, taste and see. And so he is commanding you actually to test the goodness of God in your adversity and to savor the goodness of God in your adversity and perceive its significance and learn from it. And once you've done that, you will see for yourself that the Lord is good. You fear because your life is threatened? Trust God to provide you with eternal life. And you will taste and see that he is good. Experience for yourselves the goodness of God. And the one who does is abundantly blessed. Your soul's delight will be in God. But if you look at verse 9, David reminds us to fear God when you have experienced him in his goodness. It's a call to obedient devotion, and it is necessary for our humility. The relationship the Christian has with God is governed by two concurrent truths, love and reverence. If you love and fear him, you will not lack anything. You will trust him and worship him. Even young lions, David writes, those with the most energy, the greatest strength, who run at the fastest speeds and and with the greatest sensitivity to their senses to hear and listen and smell and hunt their prey, by all account, they have every means available to them to be successful. They go hungry, but the people of God will not be in want. The body they may kill, but your soul will be satisfied. So if you desire life, listen, David says, take my counsel. Come, you children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. David isn't speaking about literal children there. He's calling to those who haven't yet experienced the lessons that David learned the hard way. He says, and I will teach you the the fear of the Lord. So keep your tongue, he writes. Guard your tongue from evil. Keep your lips from speaking lies. This is basic instruction. The wise who fear the Lord will keep watch over what they say and how they say it. They control their mouths so it is not treacherous to others. And we read this little list and it doesn't seem like it fits Oddly enough, David himself gets into a whole lot of trouble when he takes his life into his own hands by his own lips when he lies. Do you remember that? He lies to Ahimelech, the priest. And that's what causes all the more adversity. Control our mouth, that is so unnatural to us, isn't it? James 3.2 says, if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man. (laughs) If you can bridle your mouth, then you are a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body as well. And James goes on to tell us that we are actually utterly incapable of bridling our tongue. I don't think we have to make an apologetic of that point. I don't think we have to argue for that point. He goes on to remind us that we therefore have to have a heart that has been transformed by God. David is a living example of that. Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Is our mouth deceitful? Is because our heart is deceitful. 
Is our mouth foul? It is because our heart is foul. And even though David wasn't a righteous man by his own accord, he was declared a righteous man by faith. His heart is transformed, and he loved God, so even though he would fall into sin, he would always turn away from sin as he calls you and me to do. And now, in this final section, we see the marvel of a righteous man that is saved by faith. And is it any wonder? The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous, and he hears, he, his ears are open to their cry. The face of the Lord is against evildoers to cut off the memory of them from the earth. The righteous cry, and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He keeps all his bones. Not one of them is broken. Evil shall slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. The Lord redeems the soul of his servants, and none of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. Look at the work of the Lord that is described in these verses. What's happening here? It proves without question that God is not passive in the activities of the world. Nor are they outside of his control. Nor is he indifferent to them. Take a look at this again, starting in verse 15 and moving down through the end of verse 22. God is a God who sees. God is a God who listens. Verse 16, he judges. Verse 17, he hears and he delivers. Verse 18, he comforts and he saves. Verse 19, again, he delivers. Verse 20, he keeps. Verse 21, we see that God condemns. And finally, in verse 22, the only verse without a Hebrew letter to correspond with it, you remember that this is, this is written out so that each line begins with the next letter of the Hebrew alphabet until we miss one so that we can end in this unusual point to highlight this message, he redeems. But it's in verse 19 and 20 that God tells us how. Verse 15 says, The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous, and his ears are open to their cry. And we might assume that David is talking about the same righteous, the, the, those who have been declared righteous, like David. How, how does that happen? Genesis 15, 6, Romans 4, 9, Romans 4, 22, Galatians 3, 6, Titus 3, 8, James 2, 23. Declared righteous by faith. Believe God and it will be accredited to you as righteousness. Trust God and it will be accredited to you as righteousness. Trust Him with your eternal life. But you'll notice something. Verses 15 and 16 are in the plural, aren't they? The righteous is in the plural, and his ears are open to their cry, plural. And we might assume that David is talking about the same righteous, those who have been declared righteous. But verses 19 and 20 are in the singular, no longer in the plural. So he's not talking about the same, those who have been declared righteous in verse 15, as in verse 19 and 20. He's talking about something else. Verses 19 and 20 are in the singular. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He keeps all his bones. None of them is broken. Interesting. 
to make it more obvious to us in the English language, the word righteous is actually an adjective in Hebrew. So if we were to insert the applied, uh, implied noun, we would read this. Many are the afflictions of the righteous one. Wow. <laughs> because in verse 18, David had just said, the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. I mean, what, what, I thought we were talking about their afflictions. No, no, no. Remember, he had just called them to praise and thanksgiving, to bless the Lord and to taste and see that he is good and to have their thoughts transcend their circumstances and now rest in the pleasure of God and the goodness of God to seek peace and, and pursue it. Have eternal peace. But now he's talking about the afflictions of someone else. The righteous one. He's not talking about the righteous ones. He's talking about the righteous one. And if you haven't figured it out now, who are we talking about? Romans 3.10 says that there is none righteous, no, not one. Proverbs 20, verse 9, who can say, I have cleansed my heart, I am pure from sin. The implication, of course, of Proverbs 20, verse 9 is that no one can. No one can do that. There is only one who is righteous. And what are we talking about? Well, John 19, verse 36 applies this verse to the crucified Christ. This is talking about how the Lord redeems. This is talking about what the Lord has accomplished in his death, burial, and resurrection. This is talking about the eternal peace and the eternal life that has been provided and secured for those who place their faith in him when he was risen from the dead. This is how we can have confidence, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, in eternal life. And David does that by foreshadowing, by prophesying about the one who would come to die to pay the penalty for our sin. Those who are crushed in spirit. That sounds so faintly familiar with the very beginning of Jesus message on the mount the first sermon he preached in the scriptures in matthew chapter 5 blessed are the poor in spirit for they will enter the kingdom of god they are the recipients of god's grace and redemption he delights to heal and restore those who are afflicted in, in, in this particular way, those, those whose wills are smashed, those who realize their sin, those who realize that they are hopeless, those who realize that they cannot save themselves. And God's liberating presence brings comfort. And he saves them. And he redeems his servants. Like David, he redeems them from, he delivers them from all their fears. And so to close, I would make this same appeal to you that, that David does in the heart of this psalm. Taste and see that the Lord is good. How blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Because none of those who take refuge in him will be Condemned. 
But God is a just and holy God, and he will not overlook the sins of the wicked who have not come to him in faith. The face of the Lord is against evildoers. And those who hate the righteous, again, still in the singular, those who hate the Lord Jesus Christ, those who hate the sovereignty of God, will not only perish in this life, but will perish eternally under the fierce wrath of God, where the fire is not quenched. Just a couple of chapters later in Psalm 39, David writes, And now, Lord, for what do I wait? My hope is in you. Deliver me from all my transgressions. Make me not the reproach of the foolish. It is a petition from David that God would remove his sin from him and the consequences of it in eternal death and destruction. I want you to know that that is the pandemic. That is the pandemic that plagues all of humanity that you should really be concerned about. One of the Puritans who was intimately familiar with suffering was accused of treason by King Charles I only because he refused to compromise the clear instruction of God's word. His name was David Dixon. He, he died in 1662. And these were the very last words that he would speak as he, as he lay on his deathbed dying. I have taken all my good deeds and all my bad deeds and cast them in a heap before the Lord. In other words, counted them as rubbish. And fled from both to the Lord Jesus Christ. And in him I have sweet peace. Peace is not brought by our circumstances. Peace is only brought in and through our Lord Jesus Christ. We think we can control everything that's happening around us. We think we can overcome mortality. We think we can overcome death. We think we can prolong life and, and claim peace for our time when in reality, if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, There is no peace for your soul. So David says, my hope is in you, Lord. Deliver me. Strong verb. The verb means tear it from me. Rip sin out of me. Deliver me from my transgressions, he says. Make me not like the reproach of the foolish. This is one who has hope in the Lord. And Isaiah 55, 67 says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return to the Lord and he will have compassion on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. That is the tender, sweet grace and mercy of God in his willingness to extend complete forgiveness and offer eternal life through the one who is righteous, through whom redemption is accomplished and applied. Again, by his death, burial, and resurrection. Securing peace that we could not secure. Securing life that we could not secure. For those who place their trust in him. And David concludes Psalm 34 with this promise in verse 22. Again, none of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. Will you taste and see that the Lord is good? 
Will you seek eternal peace? For the glory of his name. And come to know our Lord and Savior. Seek peace and pursue it. Let's close in prayer. Precious Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for not only every Easter Sunday, but every Sunday in which we are reminded of our risen Savior, the empty tomb, in which we so regularly can recall the work that Christ successfully accomplished on the cross because he was perfect, he was the one who was righteous. And therefore, when he paid the penalty for our sin, it was satisfactory in your sight. By his resurrection, we know that if we place our hope, our trust, our faith in Jesus Christ and the work that he has done, we too can have eternal life. Romans 6 says, having been dead to sin, we can be made alive. And we can have a peace and a hope that transcends our trials, our circumstances, because we know that you are sovereign and we know that you are good. Lord, we pray that we too would be those who are poor in spirit. For those who might be watching our message today, who do not know you, Lord, but have continually placed their faith or confidence in, in man and the security that we can seemingly provide, we pray that they would come to realize how this life is nothing more than the breath of a hand. It is a phantom. It is elusive. And they will look to you. They will respond to David's petition. A petition that is yours. And they will turn in faith taste and see that you are good. We pray all these things in your son's name. Amen.